In Western languages we have separate words for heart and mind. In most of the countries where Buddhism is spread, they don't have separate words as one word. And even the ones where they do have two words, like Thai, they have chit for mind and heart, is jai. The words are pretty interchangeable. This reflects the Buddha's insight that there's really not that clear a dividing line between your heart and your mind. Your emotions have thoughts, your thoughts have emotions. And the big problem of the heart, of course, is suffering. And it's hard to pry that away from thinking. As the Buddha said, our first response to suffering is bewilderment, We're trying to figure it out. Why is this happening? And then the second thought, is there anybody out there who knows a way to put an end to this? So the suffering already has us thinking. In fact, you might say if we didn't suffer, we wouldn't be thinking. It's because of suffering that we're spurred to try to figure things out. Isaac Newton once said that if the orbit of the moon hadn't been so erratic, mathematics wouldn't have developed as quickly as it had. Was trying to figure out the orbit of the moon, they had to come up with very sophisticated math. The question is, why were they trying to figure out the orbit of the moon? Because of astrology. They figured that the movements of the moon were going to have an impact on your life. Again, on the question of whether you were going to suffer or not. So all our thinking comes from suffering. It's an issue both of the heart and the mind acting together. And from the Buddhist point of view, it's not a question of heart versus mind. It's simply that our thinking is confused. When we come to the issue of suffering, there's so many things in the world that we've figured out. But when it comes to why is the mind suffering? Our thinking gets very vague and backwards. And what he tries to do in his teaching is to give us some insight to how you can really think about suffering in a way that does put an end to it. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. They speak to this problem of the heart, which is the problem of suffering, but they apply your mind to it. If we think in terms of mind and heart being separate, they're trying to get them back together again. So your mind can talk to your heart in a way that puts an end to the heart's big problem. So they're Four Noble Truths. Why are they four? Why are they noble? Why are they true? They're four because suffering is a problem. We much prefer to have an end. That's what the truths are for, to put an end to suffering. That together with the Buddha's insight that it's going to have to come about through action. And action is based on desire. So we have skillful desires, skillful actions. And if suffering is the result, unskillful desires, unskillful actions, suffering is the result. So it's the actions and the results, skillful and unskillful. That's why we have four. And why are they noble? The word noble has two meanings in Pali. One is that it's something higher than the normal something to aspire to. In this case, the Buddha says, our lives are a search. Remember, it's that search to put an end to suffering. It comes from the Buddha tournament. We end up the search either looking for something that is going to grow ill, age, and die, or something that doesn't. If we're looking for things that age, grow ill, and die, we're going to just pile more suffering on it. We're not getting to where we want to go. That kind of search, the Buddha said, is ignoble. He found a couple of ignoble searches in the course of his practice. He started out pursuing sensual pleasures, found that that didn't lead to where he wanted to go. He tried self-torment, thinking that if he could purify himself simply by enduring pain, that would put him into suffering, but it didn't. It was only when he found the middle way that he was able to find the way that goes to the end of suffering, it goes to something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. And part of that way is right view. That's what the Four Noble Truths are. 
So these are the truths that guide us in that noble search. It's one of the reasons why the truths are noble. Another is that the universal, that's the other meaning of the word ardhya in Pali, it's universal. The Buddha compares these noble truths to what he says are individual truths or personal truths, things that may be true for you but not true for other people. And he's not interested in teaching those. He's teaching this, something that's true for everybody, no matter how old you are, what your background is, what your gender is, all the other things that we use to divide us up as to individual groups or different groups. This is something we have all in common. Why we suffer and how we can put an end to it. The details of how we suffer will be individual. But the cure is always the same. And part of the cure is understanding your suffering in such a way that you realize it. You're not suffering because of things outside, you're suffering because of your own craving. You have to look at the cause. And the cause is not out there, it's in your craving. And the suffering itself, as the Buddha said, is in a place you might not expect it. It's in your clinging. What this means is that you're actually doing the suffering, you're holding on feeding on things, and the act of feeding is what is suffering. That's kind of counterintuitive. We tend to think of suffering as something hits us. We're on the passive receiving end. But as the Buddha pointed out, that's not the case. So seeing things in this way and then realizing what the path is to the end of suffering has to attack the problem at the cause. I was just saying this afternoon, you, you go into a house, you see it's full of smoke, and you try put out the, putting out the smoke. It's never going to end. You've got to find the cause. You put that out, put out the fire. That's the end of the problem of the smoke. So the purpose of this path that we're practicing is to put an end to craving. Part of that is through developing right concentration so we can have a sense of well-being. Sit here with the breath coming in, going out, try to breathe in a way that at the very least feels good, feels okay. And as you learn how to protect that sense of being okay right here, you find that the sense of ease will grow. That sense of ease not only gives you a good place to stay and gives you encouragement on the path, but also allows you to look at the problem of suffering without feeling overwhelmed by it, without feeling threatened by it, because you know you've got a good place that you can retreat to. So these are the truths that help us look into the problem of suffering so we can solve the problem at the cause, rather than solving it at the end. A few years back I was in Thailand. I remember reading an article that some people from Bangkok went out to this far distant part of the country. And there's a little school and the kids look so poor. As I lined up in front of the school to receive these important visitors from Bangkok. And so the visitors from Bangkok arranged for them to have school uniforms so they would look nice the next time they came out. Well, that's attacking the pro at the problem at the result. You have to look at well, why the family is so poor to begin with. Maybe you can do something about that. That's a case of solving the problem at the result, which doesn't solve anything much at all. You want to solve it at the cost. And so another aspect of why the truths are noble is because they have you step back from your craving, step back from your clinging. These are the things that we invest ourselves in most. We actually identify with these things. As a result, we go around obeying our thirst, as that old Sprite commercial used to say, and learning how to step back from our thirst, step back from our clinging and feeding. That's really what makes us human beings, as opposed to simply animals, our ability to step back from these things. It gives us some nobility. And at the same time, these, truth, these truths do form a guidance to the path that leads to that goal, the goal where there is no aging, illness, and death. And that's why they're true. 
but they're an interesting kind of truth. When the Buddha ta uses the word truth, he uses it in two senses. One is statements about the way things are, and then two, the actual reality or the actual experience that's described. And when you first encounter the Four Noble Truths, okay, they are words, but they're pointing to something that's already happening in your experience. The suffering, the craving, and the potential for the path. And so when the Buddha says that you abandon the cause of suffering, you don't abandon the statement about it, you abandon the actual experience. When he says to comprehend suffering, again, it's not simply a matter of comprehending the words, you're actually trying to comprehend when there is suffering in the mind, what's actually going on. Developing the fourth noble truth, again, you don't develop the words, you develop the qualities in the mind. that are called for by the path. But eventually, as you develop the path and perform all the other duties appropriate to the truths, you find that the Four Noble Truths take you to something beyond them. There's an interesting passage where Ananda Mindika has gone to see some wanderers from other sects. It was early in the morning, the monks were out on their alms round. It was too early to visit them or the, monk, or the Buddha, so he decides, well, let's go see what these people have to say. And he goes and he listens to their doctrines, and he points out to them that all their doctrines are put together, fabricated. Then holding on to them, they're holding on to stress. So they ask him, well, what's your view? And he says, whatever is fabricated, put together, is stressful. Whatever is stressful is not me, not mine, not myself. So they try to turn the tables on him and say, well, you're holding on to that doctrine. That too is holding on to stress. And he says, no. By holding on to this and practicing in line with it, I got beyond it. This is why the Four Noble Truths are special. They take you to a truth that is beyond them. And as they force you to look at your mind, look at what it's doing, look at everything in the mind as processes. When you get involved with pleasure, where does it come from? Where does it go? When you're dealing with pain, where did the pain come from? And where does it go? In other words, what does it lead you to do? You look at the causes, you learn how to let go of them. And then you realize that the guidance you've gotten from the Four Noble Truths, that too is something fabricated. That too is something that is simply put together. It's still not the deathless. So you look at it as a process as well. This is the point where, as, as a John Munn said, all the Four Noble Truths become one, with one duty, let go, through dispassion. And in the letting go, you finally get to that noble goal. And it's at this point that the heart and the mind are totally satisfied. As a John Sweat said, once you've achieved that ultimate happiness, and that's what it is. I don't have any questions about who's experiencing or why or what. It's just the experience is sufficient in and of itself. And that speaks to the heart's deepest needs, to wish it or to put an end to suffering. And we simply learn how to think about it properly. This is why this is called the language of the heart. Not that it comes out of the heart necessarily, but it's part of the mind that can speak to the heart in a way that helps it understand what its problems are. Another phrase you might use for this is called the intelligent heart. It's willing to listen to that language, follow through the, with the instructions, and find that totally satisfactory goal where all thinking can stop, because it served its purpose. This is the most noble thing we can aim for. But it's something we can all aim for. It's open to all of us. A while back I was reading some scholar saying that the Four Noble Truths are true only for noble ones. Well, how do you get there? Well, you follow the Four Noble Truths. You make them true for you. They are already are true for you. They're true for all of us. And they offer to all of us that help we're looking for in our bewilderment.
and our desire to find a way to put an end to the suffering. That's the Buddha's gift. A gift to your heart and your mind acting together. <laughs>